What is up everybody and welcome to the Blade Show 2018 favorites video. I am super stoked to be bringing this video to you guys. Um, we're just going to go ahead and jump into it. I have a lot of categories to go through. Um, some stuff I have commentary on, some stuff I don't. Uh, again, Blade Show is a very hectic place to be and there isn't a whole lot of time to sort of be thinking about the structure of what you're doing while you're doing it. Uh, and the reason I say that is just because most of the stuff that I'm going to bring up in this video, I have video footage of. Some of it I don't. Some of it I have pictures of. Uh, and there might be one or two things that I don't have any footage of at all. So I apologize for that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and record this video right now before I sort of go through all that footage to try to figure it out. Um, and you're just going to sort of get what you get because I don't want the footage that I have to sort of interfere with who I choose as, you know, the best in any given category. And one final caveat, of course, is just that these these are my personal opinions and there are so many makers that I don't know or didn't see um, or simply just have certain preferences that make certain knives jump out at me over others so like please don't take this as the end all be all and if you're upset that i didn't mention your favorite maker or that you think that i'm an idiot because you tried the same knife and you didn't like it um cool that's we're all allowed to have different opinions that's what we're here to do so uh let's go ahead and jump in the first category that i have is my sort of favorite affirmation and what i mean by that is it's a maker who um, a maker or a knife who I've been sort of interested in. I've heard some good feedback, maybe a little bit of negative feedback, but I've never gotten to try a knife from the maker. Um, and so it was a knife that I got to try. I got to try a few knives from the maker and I was very impressed. And they went from somebody that I was sort of on the fence about and unsure about to, I absolutely want one of their knives. So the biggest affirmation for me was Jonas Iglesias, J I knives. Um, the first one that I got to try was a, custom delivery that Micah took. Uh, Micah, of course, Knife to Know Ya on Instagram. Uh, he took delivery of a Volt with a matte finish Westinghouse micarta um, that had this really awesome sort of mosaic Damascus blade uh, and these really great thumb studs. I really like the thumb studs that uh, Mr. Iglesias is using. So, uh, Definitely the favorite affirmation was J.I. Knives. I'm going to have to own one of those things. Um, just absolutely fantastic. Now, the next section is going to be the biggest want from a maker. So this is somebody who, you know, I kind of looked at their table and I sort of thought, man, if there was just like this one change, uh, I think they could really dominate the market and, and really do a lot. Uh, and that is Culture Tech Knives. Um, some of you might have seen them around as sort of, they're sort of a Russian maker. Uh, they have a lot of similarities to Shirogorov, just in terms of like the size and uh, the full flat grind and their flippers for the most part. Um, and, you know, they do some different stuff, of course, but it's very CNC heavy. They did have one knife that was hand engraved, which was cool. Um, but ultimately, their knives are running on washers. Now, that's not bad per se. There's lots of good knives that run on washers. Uh, in fact, there's other knives in this video that I really liked that run on washers. But the thing is, they're making a flipper, and it's sort of intended to it feels like to compete in that market of like the maybe the custom division Shirogorovs and stuff like that and so it was just kind of weird it just felt like they were making bearing knives with washers and I don't really like that like if you want to make a washer knife and you want to do it really well then that's great but if you're going to make a knife that is almost supposed to be on bearings with washers. It doesn't really matter how well you execute it. And believe me, they executed it very, very well. Uh, but it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't feel right. So um, I really liked their knives. They were very nice people to meet. Uh, and I think that um, even on the washers that they could have a great place in the market. But my biggest want is for them to start producing bearing knives because that'll just be another super awesome grail for me to chase. 
Our next section is going to be favorite non-custom. So as you guys know, I sort of lean towards customs, the really high-end stuff. Um, but, you know, there are a few brands that I still check out here and there that are sort of in the mid-tech and production scape. Um, and there were a couple knives that really stood out to me as like pieces that I might even consider buying, even though they're not what I'm typically after, but more that I feel like I'm really excited for the people that are in those markets. Um, because I have a lot of friends and know a lot of people where three to $600 is kind of like the place to be for them in terms of their budget for knives. Uh, and these are two knives that I really felt, um, just really are going to make those people super happy. So um, the the actual title of favorite non-custom goes to the HEA Designs Bolster Lock Mini EQ. I don't know what Sam's actually calling it. It's a sl smaller version of the Equilibrium. I think Mini e EQ is a super cool name, Sam, if, uh, if you haven't already named it. You probably have, and I just didn't hear you when I was at the show. Um, but he shrunk down the Equilibrium, which is a knife, that I have. One sec. It looks like this. This is an HEA Designs Equilibrium. You can see it's a bit of a pocket sword. You can see how much is sticking out on this end. Uh, it's a pretty big knife. Here, I'll put it up next to my face. <laughs> like, I mean, it's taller than my head, so it's a big knife. Uh, he really brought this down to, uh, I don't remember the exact uh, blade length, so I don't want to say and get it wrong, but I think it starts with a three and doesn't go much further than that, if I had to guess, but it was super cool. So he had a regular frame lock version, like most of the knives that he's produced, uh, but he also had this super awesome, 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 awesome bolster lock version uh, that I'm just really stoked about. So definitely look forward to that. Uh, and then an honorable mention uh, is gonna go out to the Adam Purvis Primordial. Uh, Adam Purvis is somebody who's been doing modification work for a long time. He got around to designing a knife and is finally getting it produced and manufactured. There are two uh, versions of the knife which he's receiving from the manufacturer. There is a uh, sort of silver titanium and carbon fiber variant as well as a murdered out or blackout variant. And I must say, for such a small knife, the action was absolutely incredible. It was super fun to finger flick with that long um, sort of cutout on the top of the blade. And it just, it dropped shut very comfortably and uh, very smoothly. And it just felt fantastic in the hand. I think it was a really great overall size for the knife, um, especially for kind of where the market's leaning right now. And I was just really impressed with it. And I'm really happy to see Adam sort of like doing new things in the market. Um, but I did not put this knife on this list because I like Adam or because I consider him a friend. I put it on this list because, man, it really, really caught my attention. And I'm super excited to see that thing hit the market. Our next category is going to be the sort of biggest happy surprise. So um, this is something that, you know, if I go to the show and I haven't maybe been paying attention to every single maker's Instagram every single day uh, and I get to the show and they're like, did you know, did you know that we did this? And I'm like, I didn't know you did that. That is amazing. That's sort of like what the category is. Um, and that's got to go to the field grade Astio from Big Knives. Uh, I hung out with JVO Designs who designed the knife as well as Matt Big, who is now, I guess, running the brand. Um, and, you know, the Astio was super cool when it came onto the market. Uh, and it was something that I was really interested in considering. Uh, maybe I thought that it might, might be too big, um, and you know, at twenty two hundred to twenty five hundred dollars, depending on the configuration which you chose, uh, it was pretty significant, pretty steep price for what is almost sort of ultimately a mid tech. I mean, those things have a ton of handwork in them and tons of finishing work, and so to call it a mid tech is almost degrading. But like that's sort of what's going on, right? It's like a lot of hands on the same knife. Um, it's parts that are you know the the frames of the Handles are just being sort of CNC'd out. And so while you do get these crazy mirror finishes and all this handwork, um, they are sort of like the ultimate pinnacle of what a mid-tech can be. Uh, and so, but again, at $2,500, that's like really hard to justify. Like $2,500 buys you like 
a really cheap art knife. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like 2500 bucks is serious money uh, and, and can get you into some pretty sweet stuff in the knife market that has been made entirely by hand. Um, and so I think that that number really made a lot of people scared of the Astio and it certainly did me and it felt like that I was priced out of the knife, um, unfortunately. But when I got to the show and I started talking to the guys, they showed us the field grade Astio, and this thing is super sick. It is twelve hundred bucks, and you can get it with a combination of micarta and carbon fiber, or just all carbon fiber. And instead of the mirror wash um, or full mirror blade, you're getting a sort of working finish. Uh, it looked almost. I guess a stone wash is probably what it was if I had to try to remember. Um, and so that was super cool. You know, 1200 is a lot more reasonable. It's still pretty expensive for what you're getting, but the Astio is a really great model and um, a field grade Astio is suddenly something that I could see myself considering. The next category that I want to hit is most improved. Now, this is a big one, and uh, I really, you know, took time to consider this. Uh, and. It, <sighs> Something that I've pointed out to a few friends recently is that when trying to decide who is the most improved, and by most improved, I sort of mean in my experience, you know, I've been to three shows now, uh, and you get to see a lot of the same makers each time, and, you know, I've tried a bunch of different knives from the same makers over the years. And so the point that I want to make uh, is that a lot of makers, it's sort of hard to see how well they improve because year over year, a lot of them will try out new models. And of course, we like that, and we want them to continue to introduce new models into the market. But if you go to a show and you try a maker and he's got, you know, nine knives and they're two or three different models and then you go back the next year and they're two to three different new models, it can be really hard to see how much they've improved. Like you might be able to tell with like finishing work and stuff like that. But as far as like action is concerned um, or just like their level of their ability to be consistent, uh, measuring that is tough because – with a new model, you might just get lucky. I mean, your D10 geometry or uh, your lockup geometry might just work out really well on that model where it didn't at, on a previous model or something like that. Um, it's just it's just really hard to measure that improvement. So there's a maker out there who has been making the same exact models for years, and I've gotten to see him at all three shows, and I've owned many of his knives. And uh, watching the small but extraordinarily important improvements uh, that he's made to his consistency and to the way he handles finishing his knives um, – I just, I'm really proud to say that Erukas Blumeris, uh, of course I can't pronounce his name for shit, but he has absolutely just every time I see him is taking it up a notch and he's running all the same models and so I can pick up, you know, I can remember each time I pick up at least one if not at least one of each model, if not every single knife on his table. Um, and when I'm flipping each one and looking at each one, it's really nice to be able to go back the next year or the next show and see like, okay, you know, the edges are broken a little bit more on this one. The action's a little bit cleaner. Uh, the, the acoustics are a little bit louder and a little bit more defined. Um, and so it's really, really cool to watch him grow. And if I didn't give him this accolade, I would be doing him an injustice because he has really come so far. Uh, and it's that detail work, that attention to detail and that, that sort of, um, refinement that, makes me spend my money on a certain maker over another because there's a lot of guys out there can make a knife that can make a knife but the amount of guys that can make a knife that is bordering perfect uh is is pretty slim as a matter of fact and so uh Erukas, keep up the good work man uh your knives are amazing this year and you're really you're catching up to some of the best of them uh, the next section that I want to talk about is expectations most exceeded. What does that mean? Okay, well, when I go to a show, there's obviously a bunch of knives that I've seen on Instagram and on dealer websites and talk to friends about where people say, oh, you know, there's this new knife. You got to check this thing out. It's super cool. Um, and because I'm able to watch other people's reviews and videos and sort of like look at action videos and, and whatever of the knife, I sort of start to develop an opinion even though I've never handled the knife before. Um, and so to win this sort of designation, you had to take my expectations and then reality and you had to make that distance the largest distance of any other knife I tried. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so my expectations that were exceeded the most, 
That was accomplished by Mr. Michael Raymond. Uh, wow. His knives are fucking bonkers. Now, I do know that I don't have uh, the best footage of these knives, so bear with me. I don't even think I have any video footage of the actual auction piece. He had an auction piece that was uh, made with that new red and black uh, carbo quartz, and that piece went for, I think, $8,500 was the highest value I saw on it, and I don't believe it went any past that, but it might have gone for more than that, um, but $8,500 was where it was at, and I got to handle it very briefly, and uh, I've, I've just never been so impressed. It, uh, when people talk about the precision with which he can execute building a knife, um, it's it's just something I've never experienced before. The just his ability to make an inlay is unfreaking believable, uh, and it sort of just had all the characteristics you would expect from something that was machined perfectly, not just like near perfectly. Or like, you know, when people say like, oh, I machined this to, you know, 10 one thousandth of a whatever. I don't I don't know the measurements. I'm not a not a knife maker. So forgive me. But like you, when you hear people talk about how precise they are with stuff and then you handle a Raymond, you're like, that's precision. That is precision. Um, and so, yeah, I just I, I don't even know what else to say about it. Obviously, it's not a knife that uh, would normally sort of like fit on a list for me. Um, I'm very much a bearing guy. You know, I, it doesn't have to be a flipper, but if it's not on bearings, I'm usually not that interested in it. Uh, and so for this thing to impress me that much uh, is really, really saying something. And the fact of the matter is it's got the best acoustics of any knife I've ever heard maybe better than a Thorburn even which is like really hard for me to say um and you know obviously it's different so to say one is better is kind of almost naive uh because they are different but uh just the the acoustics and the loudness of the closing and the opening on the Michael Raymond knives was unbelievable and then a quick little honorable mention um I believe it's First name is Craig. I could be totally wrong there. Uh, Brown Knives. He was not at Blade Show. I did not get to meet him. I tried two servos. One belonged to my good friend Sid and one belonged to Frank, Dr. Frankie. You guys know his uh, spinal um, sort of engraved one, which is super cool. The one that Sid had was good. Didn't blow me away. Uh, The one that Frank had was better than any Grimsmo I've ever handled and just like does everything a Grimm's mode does, but better. I was crazy impressed, crazy impressed. Um, there were definitely things I don't like about it, right? Like, first of all, I don't like the way it looks at all. I think it's a very ugly knife. Um, and I don't like the flipper tab. It's way too small for me, but, and I, and I, I'm also given to understand that as is true with all knife makers, really, that his variability in his detent strength is, is, uh, quite, quite, uh, it varies quite a bit. So, um, Obviously, he's very young and very new to making and is getting there, um, but I just – that knife that Frank had, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for all servos. I really speak for all of any particular knife that I bring up in this video, but uh, Frank's servo absolutely took my breath away. That was an amazing knife, and I've sort of like been not super friendly towards the servo, frankly, uh, and trying one really, really set me straight. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, the favorite new mechanism. This is a big one. Let's just go ahead and reveal it is the Holt adjustable detent. Now, stop. Stop right there. I can hear you. Some of you may have seen them demonstrate how it works. Some of you may be like me and you hadn't seen it demonstrated until you were at the show. Some of you may have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's make some clarifications. One, my biggest concern, is it a copy of the Hoback rolling detent? Not even close. Two, is it super cool? Yes, it is. Three, how's it work? Okay, well, I really think, I I think they've been calling it an adjustable detent just sort of casually, but if they are going to name it, uh, I really think they need to name it the Holt adjustable lock face because There is nothing adjustable about the detent. 
What you're actually doing is adjusting the lock face around the detent. So let's specify. Perhaps you've seen a hoback rolling detent. On an HRD, what you have is a detent ball that is fitted into a small cage, and on the reverse side of that cage, you have a little hex or whatever, uh, and then you can take an Allen wrench and you can screw, the whole cage is threaded, so you can screw the cage in and out of the lock bar itself. So what this does is it physically moves the detent ball forward and backward. Now, this effectively does change the distance of the lock face and the blade, but what you're really doing, right, is moving the detent ball in and out. Uh, also, because it's in the cage, a problem that I have with it is if it's extended quite a bit to give you a punchier deployment, a stronger detent, uh, what you have is the cage is exposed, and so the detent ramp of the blade tang will catch the cage before it hits the detent ball, and so it has to sort of scrape past the cage to get on to the detent ball and ultimately come to a close. That's something I very much dislike, um, and of course I think everybody dislikes people copying people. And so going to the Holt booth and seeing this for myself was a big priority. So how does it work? All right, well, what you have is a uh, removable lock insert, right? So like a steel lock bar insert. This is something everybody's really familiar with. Um, you have a fixed detent mounted into the fixed lock face. Okay, so they haven't changed anything about the way a steel lock bar insert or a detent works. Those are still fixed objects. You screw the um, removable uh, lock bar insert into the lock bar just like you do on any other knife. And the detent is, is permanently mounted into the lock face like it is on any other knife. What you're doing is... Inside the lock face, next to the detent, not touching, but, but close to the detent, there is a pin, a flat pin. You are actually able, in the same way that you can on the HRD, use an Allen wrench and screw that pin in and out. So what you're effectively doing is even though it's just a pin moving in and out, what you're really doing is moving the entire lock face over or behind the detent, okay? So even though it's just a pin that is pushing against the blade tang and therefore pushing the lock bar further and further off of the face of the blade tang, what you're really in effect doing is moving that whole lock face forward and backward, right? Because the lock face is what makes content contact with the blade while the detent is inserted into the detent hole. So it's really cool because they haven't messed with really any of the things that we know work. Uh, rather, they've just sort of like introduced this really interesting component that even though it's just a pin, it really in effect is moving the whole lock face back and forth. So that's why I think they should call it the Holt adjustable lock face. Um, one, it'll give them some, uh, it'll, it'll sort of distinguish the feature from the HRD. Uh, it will sort of not make people think of the HRD the moment they hear that. Oh my God, right? Like the community likes to be like that. It's very, it's very like, oh my God, did you, but did you know, you know, so like it kind of eliminates that um, and it's sort of more close to reality. So anyway, meeting the Holtz was absolutely fantastic. Joe and Angie are just as awesome as uh, in real life as they are on the internet via email. Uh, and I do want to shout out Angie developed a uh, pattern for the scales, uh, you know, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I believe Joe is sort of responsible for all of the patterns, um, but Angie put one together with some sort of knurling, like a diamond pattern and some lines up the side, uh, and that was easily my favorite, so way to go, Angie, that was a fantastic design, uh, and yeah, the Hoba uh, the Holt adjustable lock face, super, super cool. Look forward to seeing that on the market soon. Uh, honorable mention, real quick, it's not a knife, but the Grimsmo Saga 
which is their new pen, is super sick. Uh, I pulled John Grimsmo aside and had him sort of sell me on his mechanics, uh, and he told me all about how the mechanism works. I couldn't even begin to explain it to you if I wanted. It is very complex. There's a lot going on in that little thing. But you sort of push the button down and then release the uh, the sort of ring around it to uh, close the pen, or it sort of releases the button, which sucks the... Uh, the pen itself back into the body. Uh, so that was just a really cool mechanism, and I'm sure if John hasn't already talked all about how it works on the Grimsmo YouTube channel, they probably will in the future, so go check that out. I'm sure you'll be entertained. Then real quick, we'll make a quick stop in the favorite non-knife section. I know you guys are here for knives, so I'll make this very quick. Uh, barrel lights, barrel flashlights, the torches, uh, super, super freaking cool. Like, I totally get why those things uh, have gone up astronomically in value. Um, a good buddy of mine, uh, you guys know him, Winger, got a couple of those things Um varying in price due to the materials used but uh those were super sick i just wanted to say that i love the barrel lights and i have to get one i have to own one uh they are absolute top priority for me right now outside of uh actual knives uh and then another favorite non-knife i just mentioned it the grimsmo saga uh there should be one in my collection fairly soon i don't want to spoil anything and i don't want to say anything until it's official um but i'm really hoping to have one of those and i'm sure there's somebody watching this video that knows exactly what i'm talking about so, the Grimsmo Saga, super cool. Let's go ahead and move on. The best bang for your buck. I deliberated over this one quite a bit because it's really hard to judge value. You know, people value different things, different amounts. And I'm super, super, ultra, super biased. Uh, when you guys hear me say this maker's name, you're gonna be like, yeah, of course. But Andre Thorburn, I mean, I really just, I taught, I had sort of those thoughts affirmed by a lot of people that aren't in my immediate circle, uh, that sort of just affirm everything I say, kind of, uh, you know, I talk to other makers and I talk to just a lot of people and everybody sort of seems to agree that the fact that you can get one of these things, you know, this knife under a thousand dollars has a world-class action, a world-class hand rub finish, amazing uh, engraving, beautiful materials, awesome file work, and I mean, just less than a thousand bucks. He really just is the the value city of the custom knife world. Uh, it's also really quick worth giving an honorable mention to Riat. Uh, I'm not like a huge fan of their stuff anymore, but man, they were selling this integral with like cool um, like CNC work on the spine that had an absolutely impeccable action. It was a lot of material, lot, it was a big, big knife. So lots of M390 steel, lots of uh, 6AL4V titanium, lots of carbon fiber, uh, and an integral to boot, very thick, very big knife, 450 bucks. What? They are going to destroy the market with that knife. It was impeccable. My friend Sid picked one up. I got to play with it quite a bit. Wow, those things are a heck of a value. All right, so the one sort of negative section, right? What was the biggest disappointment of the show? There's going to be people that hear me say this, and you're going to jump on me, and you're going to be like, I tried that thing. It was amazing. Let me just say, one, it's not totally fair because I already didn't like the design before I tried the knife. So aesthetically, I already knew I wasn't going to be into it. Um, and two, I got to be careful because the person who makes the knife is somebody I respect quite a bit, and I do not think that this knife is a bad knife. It's just that there are reasons that it disappointed me. So let's go ahead and jump in. It is the Koenig Goblin. This is the um, collaboration between Koenig Knives and Shark Knife Co. So that is Bill Koenig and Edison Barajas. And they've been working on this collaboration for a while. Uh, the full-size Goblin is actually a fairly decently sized knife. The Goblin that... The, the the Koenig Goblin is a small knife, a very small knife. I'm um, given to understand that in the future they will also make a bigger version, a Koenig Goblin in a bigger version. But uh, for right now, I'm just speaking about this small one that they made. Um, and so, okay, so why didn't I like it? Well, it really, really boils down to two things, the flipper tab and the shape of the frame. So the flipper tab was incredibly small. 
Uh, I, I believe that sort of the goblin flipper tab already on the shark knife cone knives is very, very small. And the problem when you shrink a model down is that a lot of things that sort of worked on that model, you need to reconsider those things before you shrink them down. Um, this is true of all the mini bag knives and, and everything like that. Um, and so when they shrunk this knife down, the flipper tab became very, very tiny. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, a tiny flipper tab is not always the worst thing. The Sheer Gorov Sigma managed to pull it off, even though it wasn't my favorite thing in the world. Um, the problem with this one was that I slipped probably three quarters of the time. So one out of every four pulls, tab pulls, I slipped because it was so small. And every time I slipped, it stung a lot. It was a very sharp point. Uh, it had sharp jimping. Not super. Actually, that's not true. It just had small jimping. And because it's such a tiny little triangle, just every time I slipped, it was like, ooh, like I didn't want to go for it again. Um, and, you know, it's already bad enough when a when a flipper tab lets you slip a lot. But when it lets you slip and it like really kind of burns you, uh, it's kind of a bitch. And so I, I just wish that that hadn't worked out the way that it did. In addition to that, um, I really felt like the knife could have been well served by fully contoured handles. Uh, instead, they sort of have like a half contour and then like it's flat down the middle. And that just made it feel weird. Um, and so, I don't know, some clarifications, I guess, again, that I wanted to make was, one, I think Bill Koenig makes an excellent knife. If you already were interested in this model and you think it looks super cool, uh, don't not buy it. It will, you'll still love it. Like Bill Koenig doesn't send out bad knives. It wasn't a bad knife. Um, it's just that I found it to be pretty disappointing considering the level of hype that was around it and everything. Uh, it could have been done better. It sort of feels like a Wii knife. Um, whereas like the Koenig Arius feels distinctly Koenig. Uh, you could compare it most closely to Shirogorov's, but I still don't think that it's the same. You know, a Koenig Arius is distinctly Koenig, and I very much like that about it, and the Koenig Goblin didn't feel distinctly Koenig to me. It just felt like a really good executed Wii knife. Uh, and so whatever price point they end up bringing that to market at is probably going to be I mean, I don't know what it is. It could be super reasonable. It could be 300 bucks, but um, it could be a lot more than that. And I I'm just not sure that it's going to be totally there for me. So again, I think Bill makes a great knife. If you are, were already super stoked about that model, you're still going to love the knife. It has a great action. It's a great little knife. Uh, but that was my biggest disappointment at the show. Next up was my favorite moment of the show. My favorite sort of just singular moment. Uh, a lot of great things happened at Blade Show. I met a ton of amazing people. But every once in a while, you just sort of have an interaction that really speaks to you and sort of really hits you and you almost leave that moment and you're like sort of thinking about it in your head of like this is like a really cool a really cool thing that's happening right now um i met a designer who was having his first design produced by a production company um and he handed me the knife and i was talking to him and as i sort of felt it and flipped it and whatever I started pointing out, uh, you know, details that I appreciated about the knife. And sort of as I pointed out each detail, he would sort of stop me and he would say how thankful he was and how appreciative he was of me noticing those things because he had clearly worked on this design for a long time and been through a lot of iterations. And each time I said, you know, oh, I thought this would be bad in this way, but now that I actually feel it, you know, it's, it's actually really good. He'd be like, Man, it is so good to hear somebody say that and to like hear somebody notice, um, you know, because he'd clearly been through a lot of it. And at a knife show, it's tough. There's a lot of guys that aren't too critical or aren't too observant. A lot of people that don't know what they're really doing, right? They're just there to see knives. Um, and so through that whole conversation, I could almost see, I don't want to say he was tearing up. He wasn't, and I don't want to embarrass the guy, but, you know, I could see his eyes were getting wet. And, you know, just that like in that moment, he was like, all right. Like, I fucking did it. You know what I mean? Like, this guy just said the thing that in my head I've been waiting to hear somebody say to me. And so that was a really cool moment. I was really glad that I could share that with him. 
Uh, and I'm just so happy for him that, you know, all the hard work that he's put into it really paid off. Uh, and it can be tough. You know, you spend a lot of time designing a knife. Somebody puts it in their hand. They go, ah, it doesn't feel very good. You know what I mean? And that's it. And it's like you put in all this work and somebody just sort of shrugs it off and walks away. So um, I know that for him, it was really cool to sort of have uh, a lot of his efforts affirmed by just sort of like a random stranger. Uh, and so it was cool to be that guy. Um, another moment that the sort of honorable mention moment, if you will, uh, uh, Cozy and Willem Steenkamp, they are brothers from South Africa, and, you know, they're sort of part of the little South African crew that uh, I so very fondly enjoy uh, being around and having the knives of, but, uh, man, they were like they didn't have knives on the table. J.D. Vandeventer had sold out, uh, and so there was a lot of this open table space, and the three of them were just kind of sitting there. Uh, and I had my now pack with me that was full of knives and tops and spinners and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I was having a conversation with J.D., and Willem and Cozy were sort of like, hey, can we, like, poke around your, your now pack while you're just sitting there? And I said, yeah, of course. So I opened it up for him. And sort of just as I'm talking to JD, I keep like looking over out of the corner of my eye and I'm watching them and they're both each holding a knife and doing stuff like that. They're dead silent. They're both just sitting there fully inspecting every inch and every detail of every knife, opening it and then sort of, you know, they catch my eye and be like, you know, like great knife, you know what I mean? And, uh, and it was so cool. And so eventually I broke off and just started talking. Then I'm talking to them directly. I popped off the uh, knife section of my case and started, you know, it was one thing to have them look over a Thorburn and, and stuff like that. And of course they've seen those knives before, but then they started looking at my Gavco and my Larevo knives and, you know, really appreciating other people's work. And, the way I kind of put it to some people was I know lots of collectors who can get super excited and energetic about a lot of makers' knives, and I know a lot of makers who can get super excited and energetic about their knives and maybe about knives of a couple of their friends. I've never – before, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I personally haven't before seen maker – or in this case, a couple of makers get so excited and energetic about just – all the things that are in front of them. Doesn't matter what maker, doesn't matter if it's a knife, anything they've never seen before. They were just the most enthusiastic two human beings I might have ever seen in my entire life. And I just fell in love with them in that moment because, you know, they're makers and I only know them as makers. I don't know them as collectors, but they just seem to have this profound appreci appreciation for work and for materials and for everything. And so it was one thing to have them be super intrigued by all the knives, but then they started playing, looking at my tops and, you know, I'm explaining the nine piece construction of the matrix to them and they're like, no way, you know, and they thought it was super cool and, you know, they're looking at the thrust and they're feeling it and they're like, yeah, it is smooth, you know, like I had said it was so smooth and looking at the carbo quartz and just, they were absolutely enamored and infatuated with everything that I had and, I don't know, sharing that moment with them was just one of the most enjoyable things I've ever experienced. So I had to, uh, I had to mention it here. Those brothers are hilarious. Um, all right. So we're closing up on this one, guys. We are down to the last two categories. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about my favorite design idea. I think this is a really big accolade to give out because in the knife world, it's really hard to do things that nobody's ever done before. Um, it's also really hard to say you've done something nobody's ever done before. It's kind of hard to know. You know, people have been making custom knives for 30, 40 years now, at least in the way we think of custom knives. Obviously, people have been hand fashioning knives forever. But, um, you know, the sort of market as we know it started around the 80s. And um, it's, it's really hard to do something aesthetically that no one's ever done before, especially when it's a simple design feature that can be applied to any knife. You know, it's one thing to like make an art knife that just the whole thing is crazy and nobody's ever seen it before. That's not necessarily what I mean, but to, to have a simple design idea that can be applied to most knives or, so, or some large amount of knives that it looks really cool and to be original is very hard to do. Uh, and this was something that I was pretty confident I was going to feel 
before I went to the show just from having seen Instagram pictures, but then seeing it in person absolutely just set fire to my opinion and in a good way and and just I mean, it was absolutely stunning. So I'll just say it. It was Jason Guthrie's raindrop stippling. Uh, he does the golf ball version where all the stipple are stipples are sort of the same size. Sometimes they're all in a row. Sometimes they're random. But I don't like that as much, that sort of golf ball look. But on the colored ones, he did a purple one and a blue one. And I'm sure he's done some others. Um, but he does two different size stipples. So it doesn't look like a golf ball. It looks like raindrops. And... Each stipple, and it's hard to even call them stipples because they're big. Each dot, if you will, um, each crater even is my, maybe a better way to say it, has its own tiny little machine finish. And so he's anodized the whole thing and he's finished the flat of the handle in a sort of matte anodizing but left each little dot machine polish. So when you're looking at the knife, you can grip it. And it doesn't get ugly, right? A fully polished, anodized knife would almost slip out of your hand. It would be so so um, smooth, and it would get super fingerprinty, and the colors would change, and it would be ugly. But it's not like that. The top of the scale is matte, so you can grip the knife, and it looks great. And then when you open your hand, all the little holes are are still polished and look amazing. And so when you rotate that thing in the light and just watch every single little stipple uh, have the light move around on the machine polish finish. Unfreaking believable. Absolutely stunning. Gorgeous. Uh, anybody could do that to any frame lock and instantly make it a stunner. I, I was just so happy with that. So Jason, amazing work. Keep it up. That was super cool. All right, guys, we have landed at the absolute final section. It is the favorite knife overall section. Um, this one's kind of interesting. I deliberated on this one pretty much all the way up until the point I was ready to start recording this video. Uh, my original sort of answer was that I didn't have one, that I straight up didn't pick a, a favorite knife. Um, I've been to three shows now, Blade Show last year, New York uh, last year, and then this show. Uh, the Blade Show last year had an incredible selection of knives. I was not impressed with the selection of knives this year. A lot of people did a lot of really impressive things with their actions this year. Mechanics sort of felt like the theme of this year uh, was a lot of mechanical prowess. Whereas last year at Blade, every, it felt like it was a very aesthetic Blade show. Uh, a lot of the makers that I'm into, a lot of the tactical folder guys were bringing lots of Timascus. Lots of guys were playing with Carbo Quartz for the first time. Uh, lots of guys were playing with um, polished San Mai. And so there was a lot of cool aesthetic stuff happening at Blade Show last year. A lot of people were getting their Lightning Strike Carbon Fiber even for the first time. Um, and I really loved that. And then at this show, the aesthetics were really weak. Um, obviously, I didn't get to see every table and obviously I didn't get to see every knife. But just sort of overall going to the same people, um, I wasn't nearly as impressed with the lineup this year. It was definitely more mechanically savvy. Um, a lot of people had made a lot of improvements to the mechanics of their pieces. But aesthetically, it was very weak. And so I just wasn't sure. I was just going to say I didn't have one and, you know, I had some honorable mentions, but that was pretty much it. Uh, and then for a while I was thinking it was going to be the auction piece for Michael Raymond because that thing just absolutely exploded my brain. Um, but I really didn't want to pick that because the whole point of this category is not to say what the best knife was, but rather that if there was no budget, if I had no financial limit, and there was no limitations of lotteries or auctions. If I could pick any one knife from the show to put in my pocket and leave with, what would it be? That's how I'm choosing this. And so for the Michael Raymond to me, it just didn't make sense because even though it totally blew me away, it wasn't really something that would that I'd have in my collection. So I wasn't going to say anything. Um, but ultimately, after thinking about it quite a bit, the knife that I would have taken home was a knife that wasn't available at the show. It was actually brought by a friend of mine, uh, and that is Bill Touch, the double action um, – I actually don't even know the name of the model if I'm being frank. I'm very sorry about that. But uh, he has the, these double action knives, uh, and he had a few at his table, and I played with all of them, and so really any touch knife would have done. But uh, 
Man, playing with this thing was absolutely fantastic. Obviously, the double action mechanic has existed for quite a while. I've personally never handled one before. I don't know if somebody else's double action would impress me even more, but it wasn't just the mechanics of it. It was also his finish work uh, was really, really nice. Um, maybe not the best hand rub I've ever seen. Um, not that it was bad. I just have seen some really good hand rubs. Um, but everywhere else, just the way he finished his liners with the sort of hammered, uh, anodized finish was very cool. Uh, Aaron's knife was carbo quartz. I played with some that were uh, also marble carbon fiber, beautiful knives, but maybe the most fun thing to fidget with I've played with in a long time. And so, uh, I think if I had to say, if you had really sat me down, put a gun to my head and said, you got to pick a knife, man, you got to pick a knife. Uh, that would be the one it would, it would be a bill touch double action. Uh, those things were super, super freaking sick. Um, there are a couple of honorable mentions. Uh, Erukis Blumeris, he had a uh, LL15 with Mammoth Bark, not Mammoth Molar, Mammoth Bark, and a Timascus Bolster and Damasteel. And it, I've talked in a lot of videos about variability in makers, um, you know, in just sort of like their consistency, their actions. Every single maker has variability, especially when they're handmade, but even with CNC, every knife is different. Uh, and some makers have a very small window of where they're at. And so, you know, from knife to knife, it feels very, very consistent, and there's only slight variance. Some makers have an absolute boatload of variants where one knife has a super weak detent that barely flips out and another has a detent that's so hard that you can barely uh, deploy it. Those happen. Um, and then most makers are sort of somewhere in between in sort of like a happy happy area of, of variability. Um, I'm bringing this up because Erugis, you know, his actions are fantastic. They're still not always the best, but... I don't know if he got lucky or if he spent a lot of time on this one or what, but it was the best action, the best flipping, bearing action I've ever felt on any knife ever, period, all Thorburns, all Shirogorovs, everything. This was the best I've ever felt. Um, it was the one knife, uh, and so I just thought I'd bring that up. Whoever got that knife, if you're watching this video, fuck reach out to me because i want to talk to you about it and see if you have the same opinion because man that thing was a stunner uh another honorable mention goes to cody utzler i had never met cody i had never tried his knives he actually recently transitioned from doing handmade knives to cnc knives and so the knives that i got to try on the table were cnc he says the difference between his handmade knives and his cnc knives isn't much it's more of a precision thing than it is a quality thing I don't know if that's true. I haven't gotten to try any of the other ones, um, but man, those were super impressive. I got to try the three pieces that were on his table. He also had a slip joint was cool. that was cool, but I, I'm just talking about the three flippers. Two were sort of field grade, uh, like micarta, titanium, bolster lock, working finish kind of knives, uh, and then one was his full dress auction piece, which went for, I think, over $2,600, uh, and that had a black Timascus scale. Uh, with a Timascus bolster uh, and a very beautiful, I believe, Sanmai blade. Um, this knife had an absolutely impeccable action. The precision with which he was able to execute the two different, uh, you know, sort of Timascus materials was was amazing. Just the final thing that I want to say, in fairness to all makers uh, who I would consider for this accolade. Um, there were tables that I, and people that I wanted to see that I wasn't able to either. I couldn't get to them on the first day and the second day they were sold out or they, they weren't at their table anymore, or I simply looked for them the entire show and could not find them. It is quite a crazy place to be. And you just honestly can't see everything. So there are some makers that I know for a fact because of previous shows could have contended to be in this section whom I did not see at all. And it's only fair if I let you know who those people are so that you don't feel like I just didn't pick them because I didn't like their stuff.
That list consists of the Barajas brothers, Edison and Victor Barajas of Shark Knife Co. and VI Knives, as well as their man, uh, Will Colazzo, who is sort of their understudy. I love his knives as well. Couldn't see them, um, just didn't get to them on Friday, and on Saturday they were, they were walking around. Didn't see Dustin Snyder, really wanted to. Amazing knives last year. Uh, if Andre Thorburton hadn't had a knife that I wanted, Dustin was kind of like my second, like I might go see him. Um, and I couldn't find him at all. So unfortunately, I didn't get to see Dustin's knives. He also could have been very well improved as well. Nova Blades, I saw them last year. They were one of the knives I came very close to buying. Couldn't find their table at all this year. Look, looked pretty hard. A squared, um, by the time I ran into Andre and Andre, the A squared knives were kind of sold and I was really just focused on the Thorburns. So I didn't really get to see their knives. Although I did get to play with a full dress A6 that Matt Patton took delivery of, but I've played with those before. Uh, and then GTC, I did get to see GTC's table, but I didn't get to pick anything up. Everything was pretty much sold at that point. Um, and everything, actually everything was sold at that point And all I had on his table were pictures. Um, so I didn't get to play with anything there either. I don't really think one of his knives would have hit me as like the best knife of the show, but it's possible. And I still haven't really tried his work. So I'm looking forward to that. Guys, I know this was a really long video. I really wanted to. I felt like this was the video to spend time on this year. Uh, instead of doing the the so much vlog stuff and having you hear about me, I thought it would be more interesting to hear about the knives. Um, and so I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and leave a comment down below if you have any feedback. Because, of course, I'm going to be doing this at at least one, if not two more shows this year. And right back to Blade Show next year. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed this content. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this whole video. I hope you guys enjoyed. And I will see you next time.